Father, we come to you here on this Lord's Day to once again come and worship you. We thank you, Lord, for the rest you gave us. We thank you for this past week. We thank you for the many things you do in our lives that we just take for granted and just uh, the little things like allowing us to be able to breathe and and we know that you're fully in control of you of when we take our last breath. And so, Father, we thank you. We pray that you'll uh, be with this nation, even though it doesn't deserve any of your grace and mercy, that it's just completely turned over to Satan. But we pray, Lord, that you'll convict not only the leaders, but all the way down to the regular Joe on the street, that they'll uh, realize that they need to turn to your son, Jesus Christ, and and, and he's the only way. It's the only hope that we have. And so, Father, we just pray that you bless the service. Just be with your servant. Just just uh, give me the words to speak. And we just want to thank you for those that are here and listening online. We thank you, Lord, for the, the King James Bible you've given us. We thank you, Lord, for the missionaries and the preachers and just the all those folks are out there trying to make a stand for not only the King James Bible, but for your son, Jesus, and to, to witness for you. And for those out there that are trying to street preach and to pass out tracts and just find ways to reach you, Lord. And we just pray, Lord, that you might be able to allow some of the books to be sold so that we can reach the lost as well as uh, to try to those that are that are Christians, that are milk Christians, that can they can learn to grow and to meet Christians. And so, Father, we just... Give you all the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> We're going to be looking. Well, I, uh, we started. We've been looking at uh, how Isaiah is the Holy <laughs> Bible in miniature. And this will be uh, part uh, two. And I think we're on part three, but I guess it's only our second part. So. I guess we started this last week, and I showed you how, um, you know, Isaiah, it's made up of 66 books. I mean, six rather, 66 chapters. You know, the, the Holy Bible is made up of 66 books. And I told you that each chapter represents one book of the Bible in order, showing you that, that uh, the King James Bible is in the exact order it's supposed to be, and has the exact amount of books, not too many and not 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 enough. You know, I so said there's other Bibles out there that they go and they add extra books and people say, oh, well, why isn't this one in there? This one should be in there. Or they'll add extra chapters or they take away or or they, they do these things. And so, uh, you know, God or they have them in different orders. You know, sometimes, you know, there's this one Roman Catholic book, uh, Bible that it, it you know, and there's some other ones too, because of course the Roman Catholics and the ones they, the Eastern Orthodox, they add books and everything, but though they're not in the same order that we have ours in, and so you know, God has clearly shown the, through the pattern here of the with, with Isaiah being this miniature Bible that that there's the, they're in the exact order that they're supposed to be, and we have the exact amount. So, you know, people want to question it, and I mentioned how. We're going to look at it, but, you know, we looked in each chapter, how each chapter, it just kind of has words that'll be in that chapter, you know, that whatever Isaiah chapter represents that book, they'll be in that book, and then they'll also be in that chapter, and they may not be elsewhere, you know, showing the consistency of how, you know, sometimes it may not be found anywhere else in Scripture other than in the Isaiah chapter that is relevant to the book that it that it is, and I said how it divides it up into the, 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 if you look at the chapters, the first 39 chapters, and then it seems like there's kind of a break, you know, and then it goes to chapter 40. And it seems like it kind of changes the subject a little bit. Well, it's just how the, like the Bible is. You have 39 chapters in the Old Testament and 27 in the New Testament, and you have that division. You go from, you know, the Old Testament to where then you start with the Gospels and Jesus is here on earth. And so we looked at some of those different things. And so... We looked at the Isaiah chapter one, 1 and 2, and now I want to pick it up in Isaiah chapter 3. So, you know, like I said, those are some examples of, uh, you know, I, I mentioned how, um, you know, well, like I said, you, there's different words that'll 
that'll be meanings that we found in certain things. We'll take a look at this here. So Isaiah chapter 3 represents Leviticus. Remember, Isaiah chapter 1 represents Genesis. Chapter 2 is Exodus. You know, we're on chapter 3 now. That's Leviticus. And again, it goes in order. So, the, you know, Isaiah 4 is going to be numbers and so forth. And it'll go all the way through to 66 will be Revelation. So, so Isaiah chapter 3 represents Leviticus. Now, staff is mentioned in Isaiah chapter 3, verse 1, and in Leviticus chapter 26, verse 26. So let's, let's look at some of these here. You don't always have to go to all of them if you don't want to, but I just want to read some just to kind of show you some examples so that, you know, I'm not just making some of this up. I know most of you won't bother to look and verify anything. But Luke, I mean, uh, Leviticus chapter 26, verse 26, it says, And when I have broken the staff of your bread, I'll wait till you get to Leviticus chapter 26, verse 26. Okay, Leviticus chapter 26, verse 26. And when I have broken the staff of your bread, Ten women shall take your bread in one oven, and they shall deliver you your bread again by weight, and ye shall eat and not be satisfied. So we see it has staff there. And then go to, uh, or just keep your finger there, whatever, it doesn't matter. But in Isaiah, you know, just keep your fingers in Isaiah because we're going to be there. So Isaiah chapter 3 and verse 1. So Isaiah chapter 3, verse 1. For behold... The Lord, the Lord of hosts, doth take away from Jerusalem and from Judah the stay and the staff, the whole stay of bread and the whole stay of water. But we see there, you know, how it mentions the stay and staff and all the, the uh, you know, and it's showing staff right there in the first verse. That, uh, in fact, in my particular Bible, I actually have it even actually, uh, references you back to Leviticus chapter 26, verse 26. I didn't even re realize that until just now, but it actually has a reference to that, that very verse. So it, um, you know, it's, it's, again, it's not, it's not necessarily repeating the verse or repeating, you know, everything in Leviticus, but it's just showing you that, you know, you won't necessarily find staff and, you know, you try to find a whole bunch of, you know, other ch uh, staff and all these other chapters you're not necessarily going to find it. And so then we see, um, you know, there, there's things. We'll get to them as we, when we get to those chapters that are represented in Isaiah with those books. But like in the New Testament, oftentimes they say Matthew or different chapter in Mark or something. It'll say, you know, as Isaiah, you know, I will say they use the term Isaiah instead of, you know, for, for the Hebrew, the Greek word. But, you know, it's referring to Isaiah, but it will say, you know, as Isaiah said, you know, so in other words, it's even showing you that, that referring you back, you know, Jesus is referring you back to Isaiah for what, you know, he's getting ready to talk about, you know, showing you again how the two are related. You know, you'll see that quite often where it always would say, you know, as Isaiah said or something, you know, once in a while they'll say something about somebody else, but, you know, it seems like it's always usually, you know, Isaiah the, for the book of Isaiah. So it shows you that connection. Now, Sodom, which was destroyed because of its sodomy or homosexuality, is mentioned in Isaiah chapter 3, verse 9, and Leviticus chapter 18, verse 22, and chapter two, uh, Leviticus chapter 20, verse 13, which, uh, which condemn homosexuality when it says, A man is not to lie with mankind as with a woman. Now, sodomy was named for Sodom. That's where we get that word sodomy from. You know, there used to be laws here in this nation that was illegal for sodomy was illegal. Now we go and allow marriages and all this other nonsense. But there used to be a time up through the 60s that it was actually illegal. It was a crime for you to be a homosexual in this, which is the way it should be. But they, um, you know, that that's what God's word says. But that's where the word sodomy comes from. They were known as the sodomy laws. It's like you still hear them once in a while, like, you know, they'll, they'll mention something about that. But. So, and I look at uh, Isaiah chapter 3, verse 9. 
The show of their countenance doth witness against them, and they declare their sin as Sodom. They hide it not. Woe unto their soul, for they have rewarded evil unto themselves. So we see, uh, then if you go back to Leviticus there, in Leviticus chapter 18, verse 22, Leviticus chapter 18, verse 22. Uh, this is just talking about, it's condemning it. It's not necessarily quoting uh, Sodom, but it says, Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is abomination. And then go to chapter uh, Leviticus chapter 20, verse 13. It says, If a man also lie with mankind as he lie with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. So we see, uh, you know, the, the, it's talking about the sin of sodomy here. So, you know, it's got the connection of Sodom, which is what Sodom was destroyed for. You know, people say it was for the pride. No, that's not what it was for the, because of, of the sin of sodomy and the rebellion against God. But it's showing you the connection of how one was destroyed because of the sin and then God's condemning the sin in the, the, the equivalent book of it. Now, the word scab only appears in Isaiah in chapter 3, and Leviticus 13 speaks of cleansing from the scab of lep leprosy. Now, we're not going to necessarily go and look anything up, but you know, basically the whole chapter of 13 of Leviticus is all dealing with, you know, talking about leprosy you know if, if they got this scab if it's if it's white you do this if it's this then you do that and you know the priests they got to go around and you know they i get they get isolated and they have all you know it's all discussing about that but in isaiah chapter 3 then um so i didn't mark down the verse but anyway it's it if you look in here then you know that word scab it's only found in chapter, here it is, verse 17, Isaiah chapter 3, verse 17, Therefore the Lord will smite with the scab the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion, and the Lord will discover their secret parts. So, but that word scab, it's only found in Isaiah in chapter 3 here. You know, it's not found anywhere else in Isaiah. You know, and it's not a coincidence that it just happens to be in the chapter that's relevant to Leviticus, which is dealing with the scab of leprosy. Now, Isaiah chapter 4 represents numbers. Isaiah chapter 4, verse 5, mentions a cloud by day and flaming fire by night. And Numbers speaks of a cloud upon the tabernacle, and a pillar of fire is mentioned three times. If you take a look at Isaiah chapter 4, verse 5, Isaiah chapter 4, verse 5, and the Lord will create upon every dwelling place of Mount Zion and upon her assemblies a cloud and smoke by day and the shining of a flaming fire by night. For upon all the glory shall be a defense. So we see there that, uh, you know, and again, as a reminder, it doesn't mean that just because something's found here that it's not found in another book, you know, that I said, well, you know, this is talking about scab or something that it doesn't mean it couldn't be found somewhere else. Or it doesn't mean that like the, the cloud of, of the, the tabernacle and the pillar of fire, you know, those things aren't necessarily mentioned elsewhere. So it's just that they're relevant to the book that they are. You know, they're not found in the other chapters and so forth. I mean, it's just something you got to kind of look at these things and then when you start comparing them that it makes more sense. But when Numbers chapter 14, verse 14 speaks of a pillar of a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. So just keep Isaiah marked or whatever, but Numbers chapter 14, verse 14, you know, and you can just kind of keep your finger there. I mean, you know, do something for numbers or something too, because like I said, each one's going to go and the, the books go in an order. So it's not, I'm not necessarily going to be jumping for the most part, all over the place. So, but look at Numbers chapter 14, verse 14. Okay. 
to Numbers chapter 14, verse 14. And they will tell it to the inhabitants of this land, for they have heard that thou, Lord, art among this people, that thou, Lord, art seen face to face, and that thy cloud standeth over them, and that thou goest before them by the by daytime in a pillar of a cloud and in a pillar of fire by night. You know, and of course, there's other places that talk about this too, about the the cloud by day and fire by night, you know, even in Exodus and so forth. But, you know, we see that there. So we see that, that it's talking about there in Numbers. And then we saw in the chapter that represents Numbers, it talks about this. So, you know, again, it's, it's not necessarily... Uh, you know, there's, you've got to remember that in Scripture, when you're dealing with God, nothing's a coincidence. Everything is done by a purpose. So, but Isaiah chapter 4, verse 6, speaks of a tabernacle, and Numbers mentions tabernacle 105 times, which is far more than any other book, and nearly one-third of all mentions in Scripture. So back in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 4, verse 6, it says, and there shall be a tabernacle for a shadow in the day, daytime from the heat, and for a place of refuge, and for a covert from storm and from rain. You know, covert, that's, you know, that's a cover, you know, or, or protection from a storm and rain. You know, in fact, the word, you know, says covert. It actually has the word cover uh, built in there. You know, it's, it's showing, again, that God's built in dictionary. He'll use that word, or somebody else might use, an, another Bible might use another word. And it kind of takes that out. So again, if you're like, well, I don't even know what that word means, but the word cover is actually even built in there. So it, it makes it so that um, you can, you know, figure these things out. But, you know, here it is. It happens to mention, and again, notice here the Isaiah chapter 4. It's only those six verses. And it's in that last one there. It's talking about the tabernacle. But it's in Numbers that tabernacle, it's found 105 times. As I said, that's nearly one third of all times it's ever mentioned in Scripture. I don't remember the count. I'd have to look it up again. But, you know, it's like 300 and something or whatever, you know. So, you know, it's almost a third of it is found in this one book. And then it's, it, and it just happens that the tabernacle is mentioned again in the chapter that's relevant to the book that has the most times it's mentioned. So it shows you here that, that you know, again, tabernacle is not just found in numbers and the, the chapter that's representative of it here in Isaiah, that it is found elsewhere in Scripture, but it's just that the vast majority of it, as I said, basically one-third of it's found right here in Numbers, and then in the Isaiah chapter that's relevant to it, then it's it's found there. So, you know, you can kind of start seeing some of this stuff. Now, Isaiah chapter 5 represents Deuteronomy. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 2 speaks of bringing forth grapes. Now, grape and grapes is mentioned seven times in Deuteronomy, more than any other book, and four times in Isaiah chapter 5, which is the Deuteronomy chapter, and this is more than any other chapter in Scripture. So look at Isaiah chapter 5, verse 2. Now, remember, we're representing Deuteronomy here. So Isaiah chapter 5, verse 2. And he fenced it. And gathered out the stones thereof, and planted it with the choicest vine. Remember, in Scripture, a vine always represents a grapevine. And built a tower in the midst of it, and also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. You know, that verse right there has two times it mentions grapes. And then you see... Um, down in verse 4 of Isaiah chapter 5, we see grapes mentioned two more times. You know, what could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. In other words, you know, if you look at all this stuff, it's showing you, you know, there should have been good grapes, but these are these wild, nasty grapes. You know, I talk about the sin of the nation, how, you know, they, they had everything, you know, God was there, and then they turned, you know, basically became the wild, you know, they're going after all these idols and so forth. But we see, you know, that's four times right there that grapes are mentioned. And then um, fifth time is in James 
Yeah, it's just the one. And um, anyway, whatever. You can look it up. I don't see it off the top of my head right now. But the, the, it's five times that it's mentioned in um, this chapter. Which, so we see that, I uh, said that Deuteronomy, that grapes is mentioned seven times. You know, grapes, it's not as though that's one of those words that you find in there, you know, a ton of times in scripture, but it's mentioned seven times in Deuteronomy, which is more than in any other book in scripture. Actually, I said it was five times in Isaiah 5. It's only four times, sorry, and that's why I couldn't find the other one. But it's four times in Isaiah 5, which I just read you, you know, there's two in verse uh, two and two in verse four, which again, you know, this is relevant to the, the chapter for Deuteronomy. But that, that's more, you know, that four times it's found here in this one chapter in Isaiah chapter 5, that's more than any other chapter anywhere else in Scripture. And you know, again, that's relevant to showing you because it makes sense because it's the Deuteronomy chapter of Isaiah, which the word grapes is found more in Deuteronomy than in any other book. So, you know, again, we kind of see those things. It's not a coincidence then. Well, why does it just happen to be that grapes is found in the most chapter of anywhere in scripture in the ones relevant to Deuteronomy with that book. You know, why wasn't it in, say, Isaiah 6? Or why wasn't it in something else? You know, because it's God's showing you these connections. You know, God works everything in these wondrous patterns if people just search it out and so forth. But Isaiah chapter 5, verse 13, speaks of God's people being in captivity. And Deuteronomy chapter 4 speaks of the Israelites being scattered among the nations. Look at Isaiah chapter 5, verse 13. So Isaiah chapter 5, verse 13. Therefore, my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge, and their honorable men are famished, and their multitude dried up with thirst. You know, again, he's, of course, he's talking about, you know, Isaiah's going to be predicting a lot of this stuff that, that uh, we know that Israel and Judah... Both got taken into captive. Well, I mean, not only did they, when they were before, oftentimes the Philistines or somebody would take them over and they were under the authority of some other nation, the Moabites or whoever. But we know that eventually the nation of uh, Israel, then the, the Assyrians conquered them, spread them all out, scattered them all over the place. Then we know that Babylon came and took Judah. Now, they didn't necessarily get so much scattered out the way this, the uh, other ten tribes did, the northern tribes of Israel, but they did to a point, and then, you know, some got to come back, some stayed there. They so they still got, you know, they're, they're still kind of scattered. Now, people are starting to come back to Israel today, but, but the chapter of uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4 speaks of the Israelites being scattered among the nations. So, I didn't mark down any particular verses. Let me just see if I can quickly. But, you know, if you read through this chapter, then you see, you know, it's, it's a fairly long chapter, but it, it talks about how the, um, you know, the Jewish people, they, you know, they, they, the Hebrews they get scattered all over the place. You know, even right here, verse 27. And the Lord shall scatter you among the nations, and ye shall be left few in number among the heathen whither the Lord shall lead you. You know, and it, it just, you know, talks about uh, the scattering of them because of their rebellion and, and their sins. So again, you know, it's relevant to, the Isaiah chapter is relevant to what's found in the uh, equivalent book that it represents. Now, Isaiah chapter 6 represents Joshua. Isaiah chapter 6 verse 9 says, Go and tell this people. And Joshua 1 speaks of Joshua commanding his officers to tell the people his commands. So look at Isaiah chapter 6 verse 9. Isaiah chapter 6 in verse 9. Okay, so Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 9. And he said, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not. 
and see ye indeed, but perceive not. And then, like I said, uh, Joshua chapter 1, you know, which is the book that it represents, you know, he, he's telling the people uh, in verse 10 there, Joshua chapter 1, verse 10. Then Joshua commanded the officer of the people, saying, Pass through the host and command the people, saying, Prepare you victuals, for within three days ye shall pass over this Jordan to go in to possess the land which the Lord your God giveth you to possess it. And he goes on and he, he tells them, um, you know, so, you know, he's, he's commanding them to go and then obey, you know, and then, have, you know, verse 9, Have not I commanded... Thou be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither back be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. So, you know, we see the, uh, you know, go out there, you know, the, the equivalent there. And, you know, go and tell the people. You know, he's telling his officers to go and tell them that, you know, prepare. Because we're going to be going into the promised land. You know, they're going to be passing over the Jordan to possess the land. Right. We're going to finish um, chapter 6, you know, for I, of Isaiah up next week. But, um, yeah, here, we can, we'll go ahead and finish, I think. Let's see. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 5 shows king capitalized. So Isaiah chapter 6, verse 5, take a look at that. Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. So notice that the word king there is capitalized. Now, I've mentioned this before, but in the King James Bible, king is capitalized only for Jesus, except a few times when the word starts a verse or quote. You know, I've mentioned that before, but there's a few times where different people, it's representative as a type of Jesus or whatever reasons, then it has king capitalized where it starts a quote or it starts a verse. Well, that that's done everywhere in the King James Bible. If the word and starts a verse or a quote, you know, it doesn't matter what it, the word is, then it always it's capitalized. Now, normally in, in King James Bible won't have it where the king starts that way, so that doesn't happen. But the particular times it, it is, it's seven times. But unlike the other modern corrupt Bibles, they'll go and capitalize king all the time for earthly kings and everything else. So they don't, you don't separate anything. But here in the King James Bible, you know when it's talking about capitalized king, it's talking about Jesus. Now, this is the first time in Isaiah it is capitalized. And the other times in Isaiah coincide with books in the New Testament that capitalize king. You know, we'll look at some of those probably when we get to them. But here, you know, in for Joshua, then it's capitalized. And... Um, That, um, you know, the other times when it's mentioned, it's the chapters that represent books from the New Testament where, you know, it, it'll capitalize king for Jesus. And, and you see that a little more clear, you know, that he's the king of kings, Lord of lords and so forth. Now, Joshua chapter five speaks of Joshua meeting with the captain of the Lord's host. So, you know, this captain is none other than Jesus, who is the capitalized king of Isaiah. So, you know, again, it doesn't necessarily use the word capitalized king, but we know that the Lord of hosts is referring to, to Jesus here. So, and, you know, Joshua chapter 5, then at the very end there is, you know, Joshua, he, he um, says in verse 14, and he said, nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord, am I now come? You know, Joshua asks him, he sees this person, and he says, art, in verse 4, 13, art thou for us, for our adversaries? Verse 14, and he said, nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord, am I now come? You know, to all capitalize the Lord, you know, we're talking about, this is referring to Jesus. And we know it's Jesus because, you know, and it's not an angel or something, because it says, uh, you know, but as captain of the host of the Lord, am I now come? And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? 
And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. So we know that it, it's referring to Jesus because anytime if it was an angel and then somebody tried to worship him, they'd say, no, you don't worship me. I'm just a, you know, a servant of the Lord just like you. You, know, you worship God. That, but Jesus is being God. He doesn't refuse worship. So, you know, like I said, we know that that's referring to Jesus there. So we see that connection there that we know that, that the king, capitalized king, and the, and the captain of the Lord's host, you know, they're one and the same, they're the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Isaiah chapter 6, uh, verse 4, speaks of uh, moved at the voice, and Joshua chapter 24, verse 24, speaks of the people telling Joshua that, that they will obey the voice of the Lord. Since we're already here, uh, well, it doesn't matter, go to an Isaiah there, then... Uh, Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 4, it says, And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. But that word voice, you know, it's not, again, it's not one of those things you, you see that often, but it you know, happens to be here in the chapter, Isaiah chapter that represents the um, Joshua, book of Joshua, Joshua chapter 24 Verse 24, Joshua chapter 24, verse 24, it says, And the people said unto Joshua, The Lord our, our God will we serve, and his voice will we obey. You know, and that, and that reminds me of uh, when Jesus, remember, he said that he was the good shepherd, that, you know, the sheep hear my voice and they obey my voice. You know, that, that the sheep, you know, they obey the voice of their shepherd. They don't just obey the voice of just any shepherd, but their own shepherd. And, you know, that's how Jesus said you can know them, that they obey my voice. And that's what they're saying, that the Lord our God, we will serve and his voice will we obey. Well, of course, the Lord our God is referring to Jesus there. That's the good shepherd. And so... But we see the use of the word voice there and then also in the equivalent there in Isaiah chapter 6 that we said, that we read. So we'll, we'll stop there. We'll pick it up in Isaiah chapter 7 next week. So let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this time you've allowed us here to study a little bit here in, in Isaiah, showing that it's the Holy Bible in miniature. And, and Father, it's so great that you have so many just unique patterns and, and um, interesting things that you have in your scriptures. And, it, and again, it just shows how the King James Bible is inspired. Because as I said, a lot of these other corrupt Bibles, then they'll oftentimes use different words or something. So then you won't get that connection of showing how a chapter is relevant to a, a, a particular book because the, the words won't match up. You know, the, it, instead of saying voice, it might say something else where it's... Um, quote might mean the same thing but it, it's it does it, it lo you lose that connection and so father you know and, and even the, the capitalized king you know they capitalize everything every kind of king so you lose that connection that is referring to jesus you wouldn't necessarily get the, the connection with the, the captain of the lord's host so father we thank you for the perfection that you have in the king james bible and that and that everything is exactly the way it's supposed to be and so, Father, we just pray that you'll bless the upcoming service. Just be with each and every one. And if someone's not saved, that today might be the day of their salvation. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.